So I've been asked to uh, talk about demystifying the endocannabinoid system. So I started working on the pharmacology of endocannabinoids over 20 years ago. And um, I had done my PhD and then I'd done a couple of postdocs. And then I actually had a five year career break when I had my two children. And um, I f then found myself back in the lab and um, in the lab of one of the world experts on cannabinoid pharmacology. And at that time, the, the field of cannabinoid research was really a relatively small group of people, uh, scientists, and um, they were kind of, uh, it was not particularly fashionable research area. Uh, I, people didn't take us particularly seriously. I think they thought we were kind of having some fun in the lab in psychedelic lab coats or tie-dye t-shirts, some old hippies. And, but actually, it's a really serious group of people who'd been working really hard to understand the endocanna endocannabinoid system. Um, but now fast forward to 2019 and everyone's interested in endocannabinoids and everyone's interested in how cannabis works. So it's kind of like if you keep those old clothes that you love and you're passionate about for long enough, they will come back into fashion. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so let's start as a kind of introduction by looking at how clever our brains and bodies are, actually are. So our bodies, our emotions, and our physical responses are designed to respond to our environment. So things change in our environment, internally or externally. There are chemical changes, and that initiates a change in our emotions or our responses. And an example of this that you probably all have heard of is called the fight or flight response. So what happens is something frightening happens, there's a danger, we produce adrenaline, it's rushing through our bloodstream or noradrenaline, and that causes us to either fight that dangerous thing or to fly away and escape. So how does this work? So deep in your brain, your amygdala senses fear and danger, and it sends signals to other parts of your brain and body, and then adrenaline's produced, and that's the, the chemical, little chemical structure of adrenaline there. And so it then courses through your bloodstream, that's in your muscles, your digestive system, all sorts of things. So you're poised to, to fight or to fly, and well, your heart rate also increases. So let's look at the pharmacology underlying some of that. So the adrenaline we think of in pharmacology a bit like a key. And the adrenaline receptor, the adrenergic receptor, is a bit like a lock. So the key of adrenaline fits perfectly into this little lock. So that's kind of background there. So what about the endocannabinoid system? So the endocannabinoid system similarly is part of your body that is designed to respond to your environment, either internally or externally around you, and to then initiate various changes in response to that. So let's do a little myth busting first of all around the endocannabinoid system. Um, it exists throughout life, so we're actually born with an endocannabinoid system, and it's there before we're born. And for example, it's very important in brain development in things like something called synaptogenesis, which is the formation of synapses, and these are the little electrical connections in your brain that allow neurotransmitters to send information. It's also involved in what's called synaptic pruning, which is the other uh, scenario where actually some synapses that might be superfluous or extra are actually pruned away. So these are two really important functions. The endocannabinoid system is there in people who've never even heard of cannabis. So if you've lived a life or in a community where cannabis isn't a thing, you still have a wonderful functional endocannabinoid system. And importantly, the endocannabinoid system helps us understand how cannabis works. But cannabis is not the reason why the endocannabinoid system exists. So how does it work? Let's have a look at the endocannabinoid system in a little more detail. So here's the endocannabinoids, there's two of these, and these are produced in, in your brain and in different tissues at specific times. This is the little chemical structure of one of them. The endocannabinoids act on CB, cannabinoid receptors. There's two of these, CB1 and CB2. These are found in, in your brain and in different tissues in order to respond to endocannabinoids. When the endocannabinoids bind to these, you get a response. So the same lock and key scenario, the endocannabinoids are like the key, and then the receptor is the lock that unlocks these downstream responses. 
So why do we make endocannabinoids and when? So as I said, they're really important in this responding to our environment. And we make endocannabinoids in response to all sorts of different things, specifically at the right time and the right place. So here are some examples. When we're hungry, you might be feeling a little bit hungry now, and maybe not yet, but when you are, you start thinking about food, your endocannabinoids and your hypothalamus will start to go up. Um, exercise, when you're feeling stressed, pain, depending on the time of day, your endocannabinoids levels are increasing in specific parts of your body and brain. So what do they do? They do lots of different things, and here are some examples. They're involved, as I said, in appetite stimulation. They're involved in de-stressing, so coping with reducing stress and anxiety. They're involved in pain-relieving mechanisms, so they go up in specific parts of the brain uh, in response to pain. So you can see here, there's very, they're very, very important in balancing things out. So you've got an increase in stress, the endocannabinoids de-stress. You've got an increase in pain, the endocannabinoids produce pain-relieving effects. Fun fact, they are also very much increased in response to singing. So we did some singing earlier, and um, endocannabinoids actually go up 42% in response to singing, and also dancing. So these are two other key mediators of the endocannabinoid system. So I'd like to propose to you today that the endocannabinoid system is clever. And one of the examples we can use is stress. So in response to stress, we produce endocannabinoids and they produce a reduction in stress. So here we've got a stressful event happening, like for example, giving a TED talk um, or, <laughs> or uh, your toddler having a meltdown in the supermarket or an exam or a deadline. And so what happens, you get an increase in stress hormone cortisol in your bloodstream. And also you get an increase of endocannabinoids in response to that. And very cleverly, the system actually learns from stresses. So you, in response to the same stressful event a second or a third time, you can see there in blue, the endocannabinoid levels are actually increasing even further. And with the third event, it's going up even higher. So they're learning from this stressful event. And the levels of cortisol are actually being reduced. So you've got this de-stressor that's learning cleverly from stress, repeated stressful events. And another example of how the system is really clever is memory formation. So in response to various events in life, we form uh, memories, and the endocannabinoids are really involved in that, in the most quite um, incredible way. So in your various parts of your brain, endocannabinoids are released to help with memory formation. And for example, in your hippocampus, it's part of your brain with lots of endocannabinoids and endocannabinoid receptors. So what happens is endocannabinoids actually help the formation of helpful memories. They're involved in your working memory, like remembering dates and names and lists. But Quite remarkably, they actually pre help prevent the formation of what we call emotionally aversive memories, so things that may be um, traumatic. So they prevent the consolidation and retrieval of emotionally aversive memories. So they really integrate the memory formation system so that we have just enough emotional memories that are healthy and um, helpful and also help with our working memory. So, what about cannabis? So, how does it fit into all of this? So, cannabis contains two primary constituents uh, called cannabidiol, CBD, and THC. So today I'm really just going to talk about THC. For CBD, it really could be the, the subject of another entire TED talk. The, I'll just remain to say that for CBD, we still have lots of questions about how it works, its mechanism of action, whether it works in certain illnesses, and we have questions around its safety. But for THC, we understand a bit more about how it works. So again, we've got this lock and key scenario. So THC actually acts as an alternative key for the endocannabinoid receptor. So it fits into the, the lock, as it were, for, of the endocannabinoid receptor. And what it does 
when it binds to that receptor is it either mimics the endocannabinoid system or it disrupts the endocannabinoid system. Now, we could ask the question, how, how can this be? How can we have something in, in, the, in a plant that actually is an alternative key for a receptor in our brain? How did this happen? So if you imagine you have, um, in your back garden, you have a pile of a billion keys. If you were to try all those keys, you would probably find one. There's a probability you'd find one that might actually fit into your back door and you could give that key to someone to, to get into your house. And in fact, the plant kingdom contains many, many millions and millions of little molecules. This is the structure of THC here. And THC is actually only one of over 100 cannabinoid-like molecules in cannabis, and that's only one plant. So it's a matter of probability that in plants there are these little molecules that actually fit into receptors that we already have in our brains and in our bodies. There are many examples of this. For example, morphine is found in poppies. It fits in perfectly to opioid receptors, which are normally occupied by encephalins and endorphins in our, um, in our bodies. And um, clearly that example illustrates that because something's natural and found in plants doesn't necessarily mean that it's always safe. So what does THC do to the endocannabinoid system? So we've got this endocannabinoid system. It's balancing things out. It's responding to stress and making memories. Uh, what happens when THC is there? You've now got two potential keys for the same um, lock. So the endocannabinoid system, another very clever thing about it, which applies to most biological systems, is it's very tightly controlled and designed not to be overactivated. If it gets overactivated, that can be really harmful and become dysfunctional. So it's designed to downregulate when it thinks it's active. So when THC is on board, the system downregulates. So what happens is you get lower levels of endocannabinoids. They start to kind of switch off or level off. And you actually get fewer of the endocannabinoid receptors. So what this means is that, you, as you may know, that often people need to start taking, uh, may take higher levels of THC in order to have the same effect as they had before because of this downregulation happening. So let's have a quick look at coping mechanisms. So in response to stress, um, there are a certain proportion of people who uh, would take THC or cannabis in order to, to help manage stress. Now, it might have a de-stressing effect. It, it might not. In some people, it can cause anxiety, but it might have a de-stressing effect. What does this do to your endocannabinoid system? So what happens is your endocannabinoid system's actually been downregulated now. So in response to stress, it's kind of left scratching its head a little bit in response to stress because it's, there's fewer endocannabinoids, that, that's the spot for endocannabinoids kind of occupied by THC. So your system's not really learning from the stressful event. So rather than kind of learning adaptive coping mechanisms in response to stress, like for example exercise that might harness your endocannabinoid system, this spot's kind of being occupied by THC. Um, a certain proportion of people who use cannabis uh, containing THC might develop what's called a dependence. And that means they actually want to stop using it. It might be uh, affecting their life in some way negatively. They want to stop, but they're finding it hard to stop. And that's called a dependence. And uh, the reason for that is this THC is kind of occupying this spot where the endocannabinoids were there. If THC is not there, the endocannabinoids aren't there either, so that can cause uh, a certain amount of dependence sometimes. So we've got the endocannabinoid system. You've got an environmental effect like a stressor, like giving a TED talk, you've got stress, and you've got the uh, endocannabinoids being released in a certain part of your brain to help de-stress things. Um, Cannabis, THC on the other hand, contained in cannabis, isn't responding to the environment and it has multiple effects at once. So your cannabinoid receptors are found in many different brain regions and different places in your body. So THC will activate multiple things at once. It may de-stress, does affect memory and condition, uh, cognition in various ways. It can impair working, short-term working memory. 
may make people sleepy, may affect motivation, increase appetite. Um, it can also be a bit unpredictable, so some people may feel happy or high, but some people can feel anxious with uh, THC, particularly with higher doses. Some people may, with high doses of THC, there's a risk of an acute psychosis, and it can potentially uh, increase the risk of um, schizophrenia in individuals who may be vulnerable. So it can be a bit unpredictable depending on the dose and depending on the individual. So, to kind of wrap this up, endocannabinoids are not equal to THC. So what we've got here is the endocannabinoids are produced at the right time in the right place. They're very precisely controlled. They're responsive to the environment. Um, THC, on the other hand, has multiple effects all at once. It's not precise. It's not responding to your environment, and it may downregulate the endocannabinoid system. Now, all that said, THC and um, cannabis, also CBD, um, may relieve some uh, symptoms of certain illnesses. But there's still a lot we need to know about potential side effects. And what might happen is it may relieve symptoms acutely, so over the short term, but it may make illnesses worse over the, worse over the longer term. So these are questions we still need to answer. Scientists are also working at making new medicines that target the endocannabinoid system, so potentially things that can actually upregulate the levels of endocannabinoids at a specific place and time. So, finishing with this cartoon, I'm a scientist, so lots of research is still needed. Um, this is the, the uh, chocolate co-op company, and on the board we've got the conclusion is that eating chocolate will make you look younger and thinner. And the supervisor there is saying, look, half the work's done. All you need to do is fill in the top part and we can legally see the bottom part. So actually what we need is a lot, we need more data. We need to understand the, any potential harms of recreational cannabis. We need to understand more about the efficacy and the safety of medical cannabis for various different illnesses. Thank you.